After 50 years, the all-volunteer force remains the best model for the U.S. military. And that's why we celebrate. It has delivered for us operationally and societally. It was the right decision for the U.S. military and the nation at the time. And over the last 50 years, in times of conflict and in times of peace, it has continued to be the right decision. Our force, the finest in the world and made up entirely of volunteers, delivers across the battle space. It reinforces American ideals of personal liberty and freedom, and it offers Americans who have the desire and ability to serve training, career mobility, and financial benefits in addition to community, connection, and a common purpose. But as so many of you in this audience have studied or observed, the success and endurance of our all-volunteer force was not a foregone conclusion. I think we can acknowledge that maintaining an all-volunteer force comes with its own set of challenges. Some of these challenges were clear at the outset, the foremost being, without the draft, can we ensure a broad cross-section of American society will serve in the military? Before ending the draft, the Nixon administration established the Gates Commission to develop a comprehensive plan for ending conscription and incenting volunteers. The commission assembled industry and nonprofit leaders, academics and university presidents, policymakers and former defense professionals, and even a Georgetown law student. Although the head of the commission was initially skeptical in the final report, the commission unanimously agreed that we could indeed maintain our military strength through volunteers. At the time, in fact, there was little opposition in the Department of Defense or in Congress to this conclusion. Three years later, Defense Secretary Melvin Laird dispatched a press release informing the service secretaries that, quote, the armed forces henceforth will depend exclusively on volunteer soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, before succinctly declaring use of the draft has ended. Since that time, more than 11 million young adults have joined active duty service, and today, more than 1.5 million men and women serve in the uniform across the total force. And they have proved the highest quality military force in the world. And yet, even with that rich history and the amazing talent bench of our nation, we face today some of the greatest recruiting challenges we've known. There is no one factor driving this dynamic. We've experienced a global pandemic that shut down many schools, creating the least opportunity for recruiter contact in the AVF's history. The veteran population has gone from 18% of American adults in 1980 to less than 7% in 2022, further reducing Americans' familiarity with the military. This means fewer Americans have direct ties to a family member, friend, or neighbor who has served. And without those direct ties, it's harder to observe the military way of life up close. And we have the hottest job market and corresponding lowest unemployment rate in nearly 54 years. Moreover, the challenges we face in recruiting for the military also seem to be part of a broader drop in public interest among today's youth. In the past several years, professions like firefighting, nursing, teaching, and applications to prestigious government programs such as the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps have all experienced a decline. A recent Gallup poll even shows that there is a widespread dip in volunteerism that predates the pandemic. And this dip holds true for young adults, even as they report the most interest in community engagement in 50 years. Public service and volunteerism are not only life-changing activities, they can be life-saving. So what's going on? Why this disconnect? There are likely many causes that go beyond the scope of this gathering, but one of the most striking reasons that young adults say they don't volunteer is highly relevant. It's because no one asked them to. Today's younger generations have so many choices, so many career options they can pursue. Because a career in public service is a matter of a choice among many, it's important to communicate the benefits of public service, especially military service, to our youth. And the maddeningly ironic reality is that even as recruiting is hard today, the U.S. military's retention numbers are outstanding, with every service exceeding 100% of their goals in 2022. Think about that. 
The all-volunteer force is proving its value proposition to those who choose it. It creates long-term opportunities for military personnel while in uniform and thereafter, and in virtually every career field. The responsibility, leadership, and skills developed while in service to our nation reap lifelong benefits for individuals, their families, their communities, and society at large. It is in our national interest to ensure that younger generations consider public service as a career option, and it's also in their interest. In 1975, the University of Michigan began a continuing study of American youth, which asked high school seniors to weigh what life values are important to them. You can probably take a few guesses as to what they found most important back then. Finding steady work, being successful in their line of work, being able to give their children better opportunities than they had themselves, finding purpose, and having strong friendships. These were all at the top of their list. Timeless values. Values that align with a career in public service. Military service not only offers pay, education, and health benefits, an opportunity to travel and experience adventure that generations have prized across the decades. It also reflects values that have increased in importance to American youth since 1976. Those values include making a contribution to society, which has risen in importance by 17%, and being a leader in the community, which has risen in importance by 28%. Take, for instance, one of my colleagues, Frank, an Army major who recently graduated from Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy with a master's in policy management. Frank tells me influential mentors during his young adulthood inspired him to serve. Their pride, their commitment to public and community service, and the constant care with which they tended to the community. These attributes resonated strongly with Frank, who wanted to take part in something bigger than himself and to do good in the world. They motivated him to drive to a recruiter's office to learn about becoming an officer and eventually to commission as a second lieutenant. That's the sense of connectedness today's youth also craves and that military service and public service can provide. For the health of our all-volunteer force and the health of our democracy and civil society, we must create a renewed call to public service. We must make this ask a persistent one, coming from many different directions and of every generation. And that strong sense of civic duty will not only propel the success of our military force, it will also attract our future civilian leaders and improve the health of our civil military relations. The United States has a proud history of healthy civil military relations. It has seen its challenges to be sure, but friction is natural and our system's safeguards have been tested and held. We are a nation of laws and of checks and balances. Congress, federal statutes and our courts, the professionalism of our armed forces, the will of the people, these are all guardrails to ensure that we, as a nation, maintain civilian control of the armed forces. But of course, we cannot take this health for granted. That's why Secretary Austin has prioritized promoting healthy civil military relations. I have spent a considerable amount of my career at DOD, and from my perspective, the professionalism of our internal department interactions across civilian and military lines are the best I have seen. But this isn't just about the department's internal dynamics. Every citizen has a role to play in ensuring healthy civil military relations. Like democracy itself, we all bear a responsibility in upholding and tending to it. It's important, fundamental even, that we continue to develop mutual understanding and trust between civilians and those who serve. And here's another reason why this maintenance is so important. What we do matters beyond our borders because our civil military relations model demonstrates America's commitment to its founding principles and serves as a model for militaries around the world. Several days ago, we marked the one-year anniversary of Russia's latest invasion of Ukraine, which provides an opportunity to reflect on the stark contrast between how we and Russia treat our service members. Russia has resorted to conscription and is treating its people as cannon fodder. Our force, on the other hand, is professional, 
voluntary, well-equipped, and thoughtfully employed. That's also vital to good civil-military relations. We must continue to build bridges and pathways across the civil-military divide. It's important that we maintain a deep sense of trust and mutual respect, institutionally, but also at a human-to-human -human level, by getting to know service members as individuals and as members of our communities. It is important that we demystify our armed forces. Most service members don't want to be glorified or singled out for special treatment, but they do want to feel understood. And like Frank, they do want to live a life of service. And they need to be bolstered by good pay and benefits, education and career opportunities, world-class training and world-class work environments. Now, I am hardly the first person to raise these issues. I'm not even the first senior DOD official to raise these issues. And I can assure you at the Defense Department, we are pulling every lever to ensure that we maintain the fiercest and finest force in the world. But we have to understand the challenge America faces is bigger than just the future of the all-volunteer force, as important as that is. It is a crisis of civics. So it's critical that we foster a widespread commitment to public service. Service is about family and community and collective responsibility. The truth is, we don't need every American to serve in uniform or work in national security. But we cannot afford a future of disconnection, a future without the firefighters, nurses, teachers, public servants, or service members we need to advance the common good. We should all consider how we're going to leave the world a better place than we found it. So that's my charge to you, and I need your help. We must amplify the importance of service and its relationship to the health of our democracy. And I am confident that this renewed call will be answered if it is heard. As I close then, I want to note that in addition to the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force, as I know you all know, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the racial integration of the armed forces. With that came the promise of an integrated force and full equality, that we could be stronger by drawing on the talents of qualified Americans of every race. Today, I am proud to help lead a Defense Department that continues to expand opportunity to qualified Americans regardless of race or gender or identity, reaching from sea to shining sea. We are proud of the steps we've taken to welcome all Americans who are qualified and capable of serving. As this community of scholars knows, to be most effective for our democracy, the US military must reflect the nation that it is called to defend. That idea has always met with resistance. From 1948, when President Trump, uh, Truman excuse me, signed the executive order to end segregation in the armed services, to ending don't ask, don't tell, to allowing women to serve in combat roles, Yet we know for a fact that each of these steps has only made our strong, uh, military stronger and more effective. And would anyone seriously question the dominance of the all-volunteer force that we have built? I think not. So thank you again for this timely event. I look forward to continuing the conversation with Peter over the fireside chat. Thank so, so thank you. I, I want to pull on a couple of the threads that you left out, uh, you dangled in front of us. Uh, one is that when the shift from conscription to the all volunteer force was being contemplated, the designers worried that the military would lose its connection uh, to American society, and I don't think they anticipated that the military could get as small as it's gotten today so that those connections, just by sheer demographics, are harder to maintain. So talk to us a little bit about whether you see that as a problem and what the DOD can do to maintain the military's connection to the rest of society, even if they're not going to be joining the military. Sure, I do think it's a challenge. There's no doubt about it, as you said, just demographically, and you know that, that plays out in, in, in all kinds of ways. Um, so it does take much more effort to bring civilian and military closer together. That happens on both sides. You know, on the military side, there's a lot of community engagement that happens. 
installation to installation, certainly the efforts that we undertake to connect to society through major events, you can think sporting events, other, other uh, things like that, more ability to bring us civil society to our bases. We have programs, of course, that try to um, make sure we have exposure, the ability to reach into um, colleges and other uh, places where, where youth are forming opinions of what their next steps are. So that's on the military side. I think on the civilian side, this is the, part of the question is, what uh, is the responsibility for civilians to get to know their military? And I think there is more opportunity, as I said there. I also think that the, to the extent that we have a better exposure to public service, generally there are, there are absolutely unique aspects of military service, but there is a commonality to public service. And to the extent that we have more individuals engaged in public service, I think that also builds a more commonality and community with military service. So it seems to me the, the anniversaries you mentioned, the 50th, mm -hmm. and 75th, uh, that's an opportunity for a countrywide reflection and not just amongst the tribe of folks who are already right. watching it. Uh, do you think there's more that the administration can do to remind the people about their military and what it took to build it and what it will take to maintain it? I do, and I think, as I said, Secretary Austin's very focused on this call to service, um, and I think you'll see a lot in this, in this year, 2023, um, of us putting, making these points very clearly. First, we're very proud of this military, incredibly robust and ready military. Um, as I said, fiercest and finest in the world. Um, and we need to be talking about that. We need to talk about the quality of the force, the things we're doing to maintain the quality of that force, and how proud the nation should be of that force. And I do think you'll hear much more of that. I welcome you all doing the same. Yeah, I think something like that at, say, Duke University, just to pick yeah. a place at random, that would yeah. be really helpful. Yeah. A number of people, though, look at the present situation, look at the challenges that the all-volunteer forces had in recruiting, look at the cha geopolitical challenges we face, which is very different from the ones we faced the last 20 years, and they say, no, we need to go back to a draft. Uh, what do you think about that proposal? Yeah, I mean, I was talking to you a little uh, backstage. I, I, um, I don't think you should ever callously dismiss ideas, let me say that. But I think, as I said in my remarks, that the all-volunteer force has more than proved its worth. It's, it's, the, it's the right model. It's a model that we're going to have to work hard to maintain for the reasons we just talked about. But it provides so many benefits to the service members as well as to... Uh, you know, operationally on the battlefield um, that, you know, there's, there's no doubt in my mind um, that that's the direction. We're in the right direction and we should keep heading there. We got to make it stronger. So I thought you were, your remarks were very careful, scrupulously uh, nonpartisan. Uh, and yet in our polarized political environment, I think some people would, could be triggered by just saying the word diversity or inclusion or something like that. So talk about the challenge of doing this kind of work, of building and maintaining the armed forces in a highly charged partisan uh, environment that is our present day. It's very difficult, I think, for anyone leading an institution, and, and you know, the military probably more than any, but not, again, alone among uh, uh, workplaces where you're trying to, uh, you know, kind of reach a goal. In our case, it's defend the nation um, and do so um, in a way that uh, can build unity, builds teams. Um, that's what we're all about when you're in the fox proverbial or real foxhole. Uh, you need to be able to look to your left and your right and rely on those people, no matter what they look like, no matter what their background is, no matter what their accent is. And that's what we're all about. How do we build readiness and make sure we can deliver on the battlefield? And um, in order to tap the talent we need, you know, you just, you just look at the incredible demographic advantage. It's an asymmetry for the United States. Such a huge advantage to us to tap into every last, you know, um, a bit that we have. And so that's what we're going to do. Any smart employers would do that, is doing that, and we need to be competitive in that, in that uh, fight for talent. So we're, we make no apologies, I make no apologies for the fact that the Defense Department is trying to reach the best quality Americans that we can and bring them into the force, and we recognize that to do that, it's going to be a very diverse force, and our job is to bring them, uh, understand their, their backgrounds and needs and how we bring that together. Let me ask you a, a, 
a question about military service. You benefited from being able to be in government and then time out of government, reflect mm -hmm. on it, you come back and you serve at different leadership positions. During that same 20 year period, a military officer didn't have that chance, except maybe if they had one year mm -hmm. fellowship. You're in it until you leave and then you're gone for, for good. What do you think about more flexible in and outer uh, experiences and and is the department looking at those kinds of options? I think it's a an, uh, an, uh, model we need to do much more of. We do have some authorities there. Space Force um, actually is one of the components that's um, actively uh, building in parallel um, uh, entry models and uh, um, we, we need to really see how that takes off, sorry, that's probably a Space Force plan, <laughs> but see how that goes, um, and then borrow from it to expand it across the force. I think, you know, we're just gonna have to prove the model, um, but there's the no doubt in my mind. Yes, you're right, there's no doubt in my mind we have to move more in that direction, and we can, yeah. We spent a lot of time today talking about public confidence in the military and the pros and cons of it, but also the concerns that maybe again, as a function of this polarized environment, public confidence might not be as high today as it was, say, three years ago. Uh, is that something that you all pay attention to? Or do you worry about it? What can you do about it? Sure, of course we worry about it. I, I think the trust in institutions overall is is obviously, uh, I'm, I'm telling the crowd that knows this very well, way down. Um, we are in a relatively good position among institutions, but as part of that overall trend, trust in the military goes down as well. Look, I think it's uh, good for it to not be put on a pedestal. It's an institution, it's an institution that needs to be well-led and tended to and not considered infallible in some way. So that, that part is good to have a healthy, um, you know, uh, civilian respect for the military as an institution. Um, but it is important also when uh, times of crisis come to trust your military, to understand that it will be apolitical, it's gonna be ready, it can execute, and it will follow um, um, regardless uh, the the anything that is a legal uh, provided from political leadership. So um, that's where I think we want to be, and I do think that's really challenged in an environment in which the military is weaponized in a political sense. So that's that's something we, we, we work really hard every day to stay as apolitical and focused on our mission as we can. And do you think the department's interested enough to say to buy copies of books that might be coming out on this topic in the, <laughs> in the near? Don't answer that. Um, let me ask you a question about um, about Congress. So you are confirmed, so you answer to Congress, uh, and it's a new environment in, in Congress. Uh, what is your expectation, say, for the, the support for funding the military at the level that w needs to be funded? We have very strong support, bipartisan support, um, for our defense planning and, and the budgets that go with it. Really robust outreach and routine interaction um, with members of Congress. Secretary and I just met with what's called the Big Eight, the chairs and rankings of the four major committees that deal with defense on the Hill just this morning. That's not unusual for us to be in regular dialogue. That dialogue's really important in order to um, be able to build out that trust and confidence that you've created, in this case, in your question, a defense budget that really reflects the needs of the military. You can explain why you're asking for what you're asking. They can answer the hard questions that you're happy to go into detail with them in the right environment rather than say, you know, that's classified, you don't, you don't need to know that. We don't do that. We get into a dialogue with them. That's part of civilian control too, um, and really uh, respecting the role, the fundamental constitutional role, Article One role of Congress is really important to how we approach civil military relations, um, and it's important to how we are then are able to actually execute, of course, um, particularly given Congress's uh, central role in, in funding. So I'm gonna ask some questions about civilian control in a moment, but first I wanna, one more societal level uh, context. At the time that the all-volunteer force was being created, actually because it, it was created, the reason had to do with uh, the disappointment in the way the war in Vietnam went and the sense that we needed to go in a different direction. The 
end of Afghanistan has been compared to the end of uh, the war in Vietnam in different ways, and the challenges that, that might face in internally in the building, rebuilding, re-centering on military professionals, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit about how you are thinking about that part of the job, reorienting the military to the, the current threats and processing the lessons learned from the last war. So China is our pacing challenge. We're very, very clear that we think the PRC is developing out the kind of a suite of military capabilities and, and intent that really threaten U.S. interests. And that's the focal point. It's been the focal point for our strategy, both officially codified, if you will, in our national defense strategy from 2022, but operatingly so from the time we came in in, in this administration and polling from the prior administration. So that uh, does absolutely um, focus my day. Um, every day to make sure we're putting together the concepts and capabilities we need for the um, ability to create stability, uh, to make sure we can deter threats. We're not looking for conflict. What we're looking to do is make sure we compete effectively to deter threats. And again, PRC is the pacing challenge. That is very different than the decade or so that I um, was also uh, present for much of uh, during the global war on terror and including um, the wars in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. So really shifting the force to where we think, you know, we need to be ready in order to create stability, that's our focus. But just picking up again on the, the theme of lessons learned from via, uh, from Afghanistan and how that, that shapes uh, the profession, do you, do you see it working its way through the the building in the same way that the lessons learned from the Vietnam experience worked its way through the building in the 70s? Yeah, I don't I don't think I have the parallel in mind that you have. If you if your question is as a matter of professional military education and learning and doctrine development, there will be as there is in any era a review again of that full global war on terror, however you want to call you know call that period, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other you know counterterrorism related fights, nation um, uh, building quote unquote counterinsurgency. Absolutely, I think we are a learning institution. Um, it's one of the great things about the military, um, and folks work hard to make sure that lessons are not only learned but are learned from and put into employment. So I do expect that. Okay, so now let me shift focus to civilian control. That's part of your day-to-day -day job, 24-7, is uh, to assist Secretary Austin in being the civilian in civilian control. You're do you've been doing that, though, for much of your, political, uh, your career at lower levels. So what do you now know as deputy that you did not know as under or more junior? What are, what are the th things that you see now from your current perch that were harder to see. At yeah, I would say it's the this interesting combination of uh, c having run transition for the Defense Department um, coming into this administration. It's that an institution that I found so healthy, and it is healthy, and there are incredible people all through it. That there's fragility in that. That institutions. Um, you know, have to be nurtured, and we cannot take for granted every, from civilian control to more fundamentally um, kind of the, the health of our public institutions. That is probably the number one thing that I took away. I know uh, my dear friend Alice Friend is here. Dr. Friend came with me into the Pentagon. She was there before I got there um, uh, day one in this administration, and I think she would probably agree that fragility was very clear. Um, it's it's going to take a lot to make sure these institutions can withstand political wins, um, especially when they're targeted at the military personnel, uh, when they're targeted at civil servants. Um, it's just really hard to continue to attract and, and retain talent um, and keep people believing that they're contributing to mission. I'm really proud of what we've been able to do to, to get everybody's kind of uh, frame of reference back there, but that's something that I wouldn't have seen before, took it for granted before. And are there other lessons learned that you brought with you from your previous experience? You said, okay, we did it this way, I don't want to do it that way this time, or I want to redo that play because that worked. 
Yeah, I would say my my entire career has <laughs> been about lessons learned to apply now. And they're really about incentives and how you align organizational incentives to achieve goals. It's about making sure that, um, you know, uh, process, which is, you know, often poo-pooed, um, is um, really, you know, fair, transparent, efficient, effective. Uh, folks under understand how their voices are heard. Obviously, this plays out in civil-military relations. Everyone can think of their favorite examples. Were the voices heard? Did they have an ability to air? This is in the principles, I know, from the, from the letter um, that was um, signed. All of that becomes really important, and that is what I have learned over the years. I really have seen it all in terms of how folks, you know, either invest in the institution to build it up and make sure it's stronger, and where they're just trying to get something done fast and the, uh, inevitably those um, roots of change never, never take. And I would like change to take, so I'm attending to the roots. You mentioned the letter. I wanted to ask you ab about that. When you saw that come out in September, what was your reaction to it? And uh, if you were editing it, would you make changes to it? No, I thought, I thought it was excellent. Am I, I <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> Now that's good. I feel right. like I should critique it. Yes. No, I thought it was excellent. I, I think what strikes me more than anything, very much on this same theme, is that um, you know it's it, it's so self-evident. If you took yourself out of the context and said, why would why would a group of senior leaders on a bipartisan basis think they had to sit down and you know recapitulate the Constitution and things we take for granted, you know, the old standards? Um, I, I think it was. Um, a, a great reminder, again, that there is this apolitical um, history and set of uh, constitutional tenets that form the basis of why we do what we do, and they are worth protecting and defending, and that is what we should focus on. It's a good reminder. And when, you, when it came out, did you think, this is alarmist, this is going to scare people, or... I don't recall. I, I, no, I don't want you to have a negative recall. reaction. I'm, no, I, I, no, I didn't have any kind of negative reaction like that. I thought it was good to have a reaffirmation. Yeah. So I, this will sound like special. I feel like but maybe I should be asking you, how did you feel when it came out? Is it, I feel like a, maybe some therapy might be. I, in, I felt you know, gratified that oh, it came good, out is okay. what I felt. But, um, and I know you think I've done enough special pleading already, but I actually think that that is a, a useful a uh, touchstone for confirmations and nominations. Sure. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that the Senate will pick up on that and will ask future deputy secretaries, future co-coms, co et cetera, do you agree with this? Yeah. Is this your understanding of civil military relations? And if not, you know, how would you change it? That would spark a interbranch conversation about civilian control that may not um, be fully uh, as rich as it otherwise could be. And so, yeah, I, I, most people may not know that we have these advanced policy questions when you're up for a confirmation, and they, um, there has always there has long been a standard set for the Senate Armed Services Committee of what I would call civilian control related questions, um, and those are really important to their affirmations for one to say yes, I agree with this, yeah, and so yes, I think the set that you're putting uh, uh, that were put forward in that. Um, a particular article are perfectly viable set to, to uh, propose. So what was different four years uh, after? So you, you served, you saw the Obama administration up close, then you were out for four years, you came back. Not I was out your, for a decade. Okay, but not just for... Almost, eight years, yeah. Not just in terms of your change in elevation, yeah. but you saw... Um, yeah. what, what is different about the building? Well, as I said, I think what was really striking was just fragility um, and trying to get things, um, you know, into a regular order, to use a, a, a term, um, again, that, that is in that article, probably something people don't recognize that they need until they don't have it. We heard loud and clear over the course, particularly of the first year, how much that was welcomed from both the military and civilians who were in the Pentagon. That was lacking. Um, it wasn't lacking the entirety of the prior administration. I don't mean that, but it was certainly lacking when we came into the 
um, at this beginning of the Biden administration. So uh, again, just sort of making sure that there's a system of governance that's focused on goals and priorities and moving the ball forward in a way that is fair, transparent, um, and effective. That's, I think, the biggest thing that I noticed needed to be done. I think we've done a good job of that. What about the joint staff? How was that different, or was it, did you, when you're interacting with the joint staff, said, oh yeah, I remember this, this is exactly the same. Was there any change in interactions not, at that level? Yeah, not, I wouldn't say categorically. We, we have excellent uh, relationships uh, between uh, OSD, if that's what you mean, and the joint staff. Uh, I don't mean to sound obnoxious, but I'm above the joint staff, yeah. so <laughs> Understand. They, they treat me very well, I think is how I would put it. Um, but I, yes, I think OSD and the joint staff work very closely together, and um, uh, we've seen, I think, a, a very positive trend. I think anyone who has been around that that I speak to on the OSD side and on the joint staff side tend to say the same thing, and as I said in my remarks, it's pretty strong. It's the strongest I've seen. So I'm about to turn to the... Uh, audience, so if you want to get questions, get it, get in line. But my l last question to you uh, is: You're going to be spending a lot of time in front of Congress, probably you and the the team, uh, and they'll be asking you for a lot of things, a lot of answers to questions. But if and you'll be asking them for a lot of money. But aside from money, <laughs> what are are do you have the authorities that the building needs? Do you think you have the legislation? that you think the building needs to do all of the tasks you've outlined for us today? The number one thing we need is on-time appropriations. Um, you can't uh, be uh, working in a competition against another major power and lose months of every year um, and years over the last decade in total uh, without having a uh, appropriations and we don't can't do new starts when we don't have appropriations we have lots of challenges moving forward on big ideas on modernization so that's that's the number one thing we need uh, we need we need the appropriations bill um, the other kinds of authorities yes every year we put forward authorities that would help us but I wouldn't say any of those you know we, we aren't sort of crippled in any way um, with on-time appropriations and in strong partnership with Congress and they have given us a lot of authorities honestly oftentimes it's on our side to make sure we're using the full authorities that we have um, but yeah, they're, they're little tweaks we can move forward on. They're, they're in personnel policy. We just talked about some areas where if we can demonstrate good use of the authorities we have, we might want to go for some others. Um, and that would be, I think personnel policy would actually be high up on my list. On the acquisition side, we have pretty good authorities. There are some um, standard, this not law, but standard ways of interacting between appropriation cycles that uh, it, would be, it would be great if we had more flexibility from Congress on how we, how we acted in between appropriation cycles so we can move forward promising new technologies and capabilities. And you said you had very fruitful meetings with the Gang of Eight. It was, sure. was is, are you optimistic that you're going to get on-time appropriations and the, the things you need, or are you moving into this year looking at the challenges across the river and thinking, hmm, maybe not this year? Yeah, I, I, I'm always optimistic. I don't think I would still be in public service after 30 years if I didn't fundamentally believe that this nation has um, great um, opportunity and great promise, and that includes our ability to work within Washington to get done, the American people's work done. So I'm optimistic. Good. Let's go here for the first question. Sure. Thank you so much. Madam Deputy Secretary, um, thank you so much for your remark. My name is Brian. I'm from Taiwan, and I'm a junior here at the School of Foreign Service. Uh, today's topic is about the 50-year anniversary of the uh, all-volunteer force. But if I may please, I want to ask you a question about US and Taiwan military relation. So, pursuant to the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan has long been confined to defensive natures. On the one hand, this was intended to not provoke China. And on the other hand, this is um, because Taiwan still had the potential to assault China back then, and this nature of arms sale prevented this. However, fast forward 40 years to 2000, 2023 right now, Taiwan has already lost its ability and will to assault China, while China is growing more aggressive against Taiwan. Moreover, possessing only defensive weapons, as we have seen in the Ukrainian case, uh, 
fails to effectively deter enemies from waging a war, and in the case of a war, fails to quickly and swiftly push the enemy out. On the other hand, countries like Israel with effective offensive weapons were able to deter wars. I think That's you want to ask her, can we do offensive weapons? That's yes, the question. Yes, exactly. Great question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, uh, first of all, a fine essay. Uh, so, so thank. It's a, a, a well, well put together. Um, the United States is committed to the Taiwan Relations Act. We are absolutely committed to assisting Taiwan in its self-defense. I disagree with the premise of your question entirely. Um, I think the first of all that there is much more that uh, the Taiwan could do alongside partners like the United States to strengthen its self-defense. Those are not just systems. Those are. Um, improvements that are already underway or talked about in Taiwan with regard to the improvements of their own military, talk about professionalization and the advantages of um, making sure you have longer conscription cycles and other things of that sort. I'll just also add that um, Taiwan does have uh, partners and, and friends to count on, and its ability to deter aggression against it is not its alone to bear. Um, and that's why the United States uh, works so hard to make clear, as I said, that all, we are a force for stability. We're not looking for conflict. But we do believe uh, that the state of affairs across the Taiwan Strait should be maintained peacefully. Let me sneak in my own Taiwan question on the back of that. Many uh, folks outside who are opposed to the efforts in Ukraine say we shouldn't focus on Ukraine. We should focus on Taiwan, that it's sure. a distraction. Uh, and we're sending weapons to Ukraine that are needed in Taiwan. So they try to put the two theaters against each sure. other. That's not the Biden administration view. Explain wh what that argument is missing, if you would. Sure, there's a couple different elements. Let me start with the um, kind of the concrete part, which is we are not trading off um, arms, for instance, that are in the foreign military sales process for Taiwan. We're not giving those away or, uh, or selling them somehow um, uh, using our authorities from Congress for, for Ukraine. Two totally different processes, the presidential drawdown authority that we've been using um, for the kinds of systems that folks are familiar with in the Taiwan case. Those are coming out of U.S. stocks, older systems coming out of U.S. stocks. Taiwan, um, that, those are purchases for new systems. So that's sort of the most concrete version. Um, here's the bigger strategic issue. Uh, what, you, what the Ukraine crisis has demonstrated is that um, a country that is willing to defend itself, that can um, bring the will and the capability, can really attract substantial international support um, if it's, there's an aggressor against it. Um, and that is a big takeaway for Russia. It's a big takeaway for Taiwan. It's a big takeaway for the PRC. Um, they are seeing incredible economic effects on Russia. That worries them. Uh, they are seeing the unity of not just Europe, but an international community in support of Ukraine. That worries them. And they're seeing that the United States is actually galvanizing its industrial base um, and thinking about how that industrial base can perform not only in support of the Ukraine crisis, but in future conflicts. Dr. Grove. Ma'am, Dr. Brian Groves, I'm a colonel at Army Forces Command. I spent my last couple of years prior to that on the Joint Staff, so I'm glad that you felt we treated you well. <laughs> I'm glad you did too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So yesterday, the National Military Strategy was delivered to congressional leaders. I had the privilege of helping lead that team during my time there. And so I'm interested in your perspective on the role that authoritative documents uh, largely in this case with the NDS and the NMS that are congressionally mandated play in their interaction with each other and in uh, the Hill's oversight of DOD and anything that you uh, might want to share about that. Sure. So I think the the rich history in the and, and even the incentives that drive strong alignment and codification you know, through multi-layered, whether it's strategy documents, planning documents, et cetera, that's really healthy inside um, the military institution. It helps to make sure that commander's intent and guidance is pushed down all the way through the system um, and is a continual opportunity to reinforce 
the tie of the goals to the actions that are happening at lower levels. I'll just add a secondary piece to that, which is when you're at the lower levels, um, it's always good to understand how you fit into the system because, as I said, part of what is such a great, um, uh, you know, a proposition in the military or in for civilians in, in public service is how am I, you know, how am I contributing to mission today? And that sort of cascading of documents and formalization of ties really always helps orient folks to where they fit in the system and how it connects to bigger national level goals. So that's my view and I, I think Congress has been able to codify that including the NMS um, over the years to help, you know, regardless of what administration is, help kind of create that discipline. Good afternoon, Madam Secretary. My name is Major Sharon Susparo. Um, one key element mentioned here but emphasized in previous discussions regarding the AVF is the increasing importance of women and immigrants and the role that they'll play for our future forces. However, there still remains barriers to our retention and meaningful employment. Despite fairly good retention numbers, retention of women remains very low. I'm confident that should you ask any minority military member how to remove these barriers, they would have an answer. But their recommendations often get stuck in the frozen middle. How do we raise the real concerns of our underrepresented groups to catapult action? Yeah, I mean, I just want to validate the, again, the premise in this case, which is that the retention rates are lower uh, for women and for minorities um, in the armed forces. Um, so we know, again, as I said, retention overall is quite high. It's something to lean into, which is, you know, once we have folks in the force, we do a better job uh, retaining them. So we want to make sure we can have that same quality of retention and advancement, of course, is part of the issue, which is the we're not in the right proportion in our advancement, and so retention is always going to be challenged when that's the case. So I think one of the first and most obvious things I would say is uh, we need people above the frozen middle. And so that's where you see, you know, right now we have, um, you know, several of our combatant commanders uh, are, are female. We have um, uh, the VCNO is female. Um, those sort of senior, uh, they're not just role models, they're decision makers. Um, they're not just in the room or at the table, they're at the head of the table. That makes a huge difference, I can tell you firsthand representation matters. And so I think making sure we have, in this case, women, but a, a, a force that is representative all the way through its ranks is one of the best things we can do to make sure that we understand the barriers and we can remove them. There's lots of other efforts underway, of course, throughout the department. As I said, I think the goal always in the Defense Department is to think about readiness and you know t how you build a holistic view of readiness is making sure you're looking out for your teammates. We have a massive effort underway, for instance, on countering sexual assault and sexual harassment. That affects people of all genders, but it certainly affects women more than others. Um, I think that's a big piece of our retention story as well. Can I ask you to apply that question to the civilian side of DOD? Uh, what changes have you seen over your career uh, in terms of opportunities for women and also the experience of women serving in national security posts like DOD? Yeah, I think in DOD we, you know, it's selfishly, I think we do pretty well. It's something we're constantly looking at, certainly for the political appointees, but also for the senior career. I was a senior, uh, I was a career SES, excuse me, before I uh, became a political appointee. So I'm, I'm, I'm particularly attuned to that, and, and I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but they're, but they're relatively good. I think across the national security community, it continues to be a challenge. Um, so it's something to watch overall. Okay. Thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary. Um, my name is Christian. I'm a first year uh, master's student here and teaching assistant with the uh, Security Studies program at Georgetown. Um, acquisition uh, and budgets have been talked about a little tangentially today. Um, uh, obviously, uh, it's important to innovation and the small business strategy was just released, I believe, last month. Um, but pertaining to civil military relations, are there any changes that you would recommend um, in terms of the distribution of responsibilities between OSD and the military services when it comes to acquisition, budget, or you know, innovation writ large, whether it's like bureaucratic structure or um, agency of the individuals involved? Um, I, I would not, to, to really the question you're asking, I would not uh, currently 
uh, recommend reversing the last round of major acquisition reforms. Um, I, we can make it work. I think one of the biggest, un, um, how do I put this? For folks who have not lived in an organization or institution, um, I think it is common to underestimate how incredibly disruptive it is to constantly change statute slash organizational structure or wiring diagrams. Um, I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in getting after how we modernize as quickly as humanly possible, and that basically means work with the system we have and start moving it. Get the right people in the right jobs, remove barriers, um, work with Congress where necessary um, uh, you know, to build the trust to get the next level of effort going. But right now, I think it's working just fine having the services have more acquisition authority than they had, say, a decade ago. I'm not saying that's what I would have recommended, but I, I think the system that we have today, we can work with, and that's where our focus should be making it work. Hi, Dr. Hicks. My name is Samuel Chen. I'm a freshman at George Washington University. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, funny enough, I'm also uh, Taiwanese, and I think the, the last two people have kind of <laughs> asked the questions I kind of wanted to ask. So I just wanted to talk to you about the planning, programming, budgeting, and executing part of Congress PPBE. Um, in regards to modernization, I suppose we can go in that direction. Um, I've done a lot of readings on like the, sh the value of death when it comes to how a lot of our modernization programs kind of fall through because you know the, the, the constant two-year cycle. Um, I'm not quite sure your exact um, role when it comes to like planning in depth on budgeting, but if you can make any policy recommendations for either Congress or for OSD on how we could better avoid that value of death, how would you go about it? Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Um, First of all, you said PPB and Valley of Death, so I'm so I'm so happy. This was all worth it just for that. Um, uh, my happy place. Uh, so there are many challenges, and there because there are many valleys of death. There are many points of transition within the defense enterprise in order to get a capability from, let's say, at its you know, basic research and, and engineering stage all the way to fielded capability. And it changes hands many times over. It actually relates in some ways to the, to the prior question. Um, so my goal is really to identify which of those valleys of death are most um, impacting, negatively impacting the ability of the warfighter to get the capabilities that she or he needs. Um, and going after re removing those barriers. So some of the places that we are focused on are what's called transition, which is probably the most directly relevant. How do you make sure that you can transition capabilities in any one of those you know, break points? Um, and there are things we need from Congress to do that. Congress on the authorizing side has created some transition funds that help us work between appropriation cycles. Um, the appropriators uh, don't like those, they don't like those kinds of funds because they're not, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in those. So we work hard. We were given some appropriations, for instance, recently. We're working hard to prove that we are using them um, appropriately. And that's the kind of thing that we try to do to sort of then be able to scale that. Um, so that's transition. We're looking at security processes. Um, so that can be security clearances for contractors, making sure that the security of facilities is easier so that uh, building out a system isn't left only to those major prime contractors who can absorb the transaction costs, but that, say, a small business could still be competitive um, if we can help them get a secure um, facility. That's another example. Our training our acquisition workforce in the latest approaches, so we have lots of different authorities. Other transactional authority is an example that many folks on the Hill have tended to be okay with. We have these middle tier acquisition processes that we pursue, also authorized by Congress, but they're still a little suspect of how we use them. So making sure we use all those authorities really effectively means we have to train our acquisition workforce to know how to use them. And so those are just some examples. Uh, bottom line, there is no silver bullet. It's not a wiring diagram. It's not a new authority. It is making looking at the system at a systems level and making sure you understand where the, where the, in a nodal analysis way, where the hard areas are and working those hard areas to make sure we can get the warfighter what she or he needs. 
buried in his question was another one that maybe you could take 30 seconds to answer. He said, I don't know what the deputy secretary does. <laughs> Folks might not know. I didn't mean that. Uh, outside might not know what the deputy secretary does. So can you just give us the 30 second version of what your job is as I deputy? I think the 30 second version is that I am essentially the COO. B back to the advanced policy questions. One of yes. the things Congress says is, do you intend to follow the uh, uh, normal um, division of labor between the secretary and the deputy secretary of defense? And the answer, they asked both Secretary Austin as a nominee, they asked me as a nominee, and the answer we, of course, both gave is yes, uh, which is the secretary, generally speaking, is focused up and out. He's looking, uh, he's, you know, working with allies and partners. He's working closely with the White House um, in the interagency process. Um, et cetera. I am very much focused uh, down and in, as we would say, a, a chief operating officer of the organization, trying to make sure his priorities um, are um, executed and implemented throughout the department. Great. And last question in the back there. Hello, Madam Secretary. Um, um, my name is Gabriel Beltran. I am um, originally, I was born in Colombia, but I joined the Army, and I just got out like around two months ago. I, I am in the um, security studies program in the first semester. Um, as, as, as you were saying, uh, I have seen the, the, the diversity in the military, right, and the open doors that the military have for minorities such as me, as you can tell by my accent. And <laughs> so uh, while I was in the military, uh, I learned so many things, and, and it was uh, such a great opportunity. However, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to uh, dig a little, a little bit deeper on was the mental health of soldiers, right? Um, I'm also a survivor spouse, and I have seen how, I have seen the effects on, on, on the mental health of soldiers, right? And I also saw so many times how difficult it is for senior leaders to realize about the challenges mm. on this. So um, I, I believe that uh, an army, our military force is as strong as their people, Right, and um, I wanted to ask you. So, on your um, on, on your level, on a senior level, what are the change, changes that you have seen that improve uh, the system um, that senior leaders have to address the mental health issues on soldiers? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thank you. I'm so glad you raised the topic. Um, we have, of course, in the nation a mental health crisis. I, I think everyone is well aware that we uh, don't have enough providers across the nation. We have um, a burgeoning in, you know, interest in mental health, which is fantastic, um, that we are increasingly normalizing the view that health is health is health, and mental health is part of health. Um, and that's true in DOD as well. And that's a, that's a sea change, that's a cultural change. Um, it takes leaders, and we do have leaders in uniform who are good about, you know, tweeting or writing or otherwise indicating, hey, I'm, I'm off to my mental health appointment now. Uh, that becomes very important. Same on suicide prevention, where folks talk, where are willing to talk about um, suicidal ideation and the way they, over, you know, have overcome suicidal ideation, things of that sort. What we have found really works well are small group interactions. That's true, basically, of any training. Um, and so we're increasingly using that. A couple other tools that we're doing. I mentioned before that we have put a substantial investment into countering sexual assault and sexual harassment. We have built something called the Prevention Workforce. We are hiring thousands of Prevention Workforce um, members. And uh, while the core of the purpose behind them was to counter sexual assault and sexual harassment, they're really going to be focused on uh, self-harm and harm issues, behavioral issues that are intersectional. Um, and so that is mental health being one of those. So we think that major hiring of prevention workforce, some of which will inevitably gonna, going to have to be reskilling for the reasons I pointed out in terms of the mental health provider crisis, I think that's going to be really important. Last thing I'll just mention, because we have a lot underway, um, is uh, uh, Telemental health. Um, we have greatly expanded the provision of telehealth for behavioral uh, specialists and mental health appointments. That's particularly important important for those who are in remote locations. Um, Alaska would be a good example of that. And we have increased over the last year something like 60,000 plus appointment availability, and we're continuing to expand that through the Defense Health Agency. So thank you for what you do down and in. 
And on behalf of the Georgetown Security Studies Program and, and the America in the World Consortium, thank you for coming out once in a while <laughs> and talking to your thank people. Thank you for inviting me. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.